Okay, then that would have been Pam. I mean, would have been Dawn, excuse me. Yeah, would have been Dawn. Yeah. Oh. Okay, folks, uh, we're about to get started. Um, let, me, let me remind you we're starting a new, whole new book today, and we're going to do it a little, some of it a little bit different. In your workbook, please take out your at-a-glance chart and your three chapters in Titus. Today's lesson is an overview of Titus. We'll get a lot of it done today, but we really go deeper in the other weeks into this time. Um, now, I will also tell you, this is designed that we do it in one week. We are not committed to that. If it takes more than one week for us to get through a lesson, I would rather do that and have everyone understand what is taking place in the scripture than for us to, you know, okay, we got to get through in an hour's time. We got to cover three chapters in an hour and know everything that, that we're supposed to. So that's, that is my, that's my plan. And if, you know, if we get through with the overview today, well, great. If we don't, we will pick it up again next week. So Having said that, I do have two other announcements. One, um, if you were here over the weekend for our retreat, we do have a couple of folks who tested positive for COVID yesterday. Um, n no, you didn't. No, they were at this table. Patty and Jim Smith both tested uh, positive for COVID yesterday. So, uh, uh, Brooks is running our uh, streaming this morning, and we appreciate that. But if you were in close contact with either of them uh, Friday and Saturday and you start to feel bad, I tell you, go to the doctor. Uh, because Jim says he doesn't feel all that bad, but that was yesterday. I don't know how he feels today. But uh, um, I, I, I just felt like I should warn you of that. The other thing is, did anyone pick up a pink bag? It belongs to Shirley, and it had her favorite study Bible in it, and it is now amongst the missing. So um, we need to we need to help her find the pink bag that has uh, the bag could be replaced, I'm sure, but the Bible is the the main thing. So. Having said that, let me remind you that while we're streaming, hold your questions, and at the end, you'll have a chance to ask any questions that you want to, but uh, you'll have a chance to answer any of the questions that you'd like to. It's fine, but, um, but just hold your questions while we're streaming because the people on the other side of that screen have no idea what you're saying, and it only confuses them. So uh, if you will, whatever your comments or your questions are, hold them until we are finished, and then, then we'll take care of them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming before you. We thank you that we can open your word and that you speak to us so clearly through your word. And as we look at this very short, very concise, but very timely letter that Paul is writing to his child in the faith, we just ask you to open our hearts, open our minds, help us to understand how to apply this in our life today. Help us to take the truth of these lessons and put them into practice. Now, Help us to take this time and focus entirely on you. We just ask you to take away every foreign thought that we would have. We ask a blessing on those who are away from us this morning, some who are sick and some who are traveling, and we just we pray that, that you will be with them and that they will feel your presence. We especially pray for those that will be joining us online 
that, uh, that they will receive a blessing from the time that they have in your word with us. Forgive us of our sins, for we pray all of this in the name of our brother, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I said, take out your observation worksheets and your at-a-glance chart because we're going to actually do those. I know you were told in your homework to do them, but we're really going to do them this time. This is such a timely book. This, um, I can tell you what, uh, what Matt said when he realized we were doing Titus. He said, good, let, uh, uh, make sure you teach them all how to be good church members. <laughs> so uh, that, that being said, we are going to uh, sort of set the stage here or the scene for uh, as Paul is uh, penning this letter to Titus. Uh, he has sailed past the island of Crete and uh, as a Roman prisoner, he's, he's in between two Roman imprisonments. And uh, sailing under duress, high winds, uh, things that were going on, the ship sank to the bottom of the, uh, of the water. Very much like Crete had sunk to the very depths of sin and degradation. This all happened about 62 A.D., and as we look at what Paul was writing to this godless society, we can apply it so well to our own world today. We can apply what's going on in our world. We can see us in this letter that he writes to Titus. Uh, he writes it to Titus as he's left Titus on the island of Crete with a specific task to accomplish. And we're going to look at that task. And he was saying to Titus, now there are people in this area who are very ungodly. There are people who are teaching things that not only are wrong, but they are damaging families. They're hurting relationships. They are, they're teaching heresies. And so I'm going to leave you there, and I'm going to leave you with a mission to help straighten this out. Legalism was very prevalent in this group. And, you know, we struggle, not, maybe not as much now as we used to, but how many of you can remember the time when if you, well, I'm really dating myself, but you remember a time, maybe some of us will, when you dressed up to come to church. You know, Easter Sunday, everybody had hats and gloves. You know, I look at pictures from the past and I think, oh my goodness, and I got two little boys ready and uh, Denny drove the bus to pick up the special needs children, and off we all went. You know, and we still got there on time. But if you didn't dress like that, I think I've told you, one of my aunts was mortified when one of the uh, GA leaders wore pants on Wednesday night. She said, have you ever seen such? Her mother would turn over in her grave. <laughs> Legalism is a problem within uh, religious circles, even today, though not to the extent that it was. So as we begin, I want you to take out your, um, your at-a-glance chart, and we're going to begin working on, uh, on what this, you know, on this chart. We're going to begin working on uh, filling it out and keeping it, um, keeping it up to date, and I have at some point lost my notes here um, that I had very carefully so we will we will go on without them they'll probably show up at some place um, but where I have no idea what I've done with those things um, oh well so we're going to begin in the uh, with the uh, at a glance chart the first thing we want to do is w did any of you uh, come up with, you raise your hands, did you come up with a theme for this book? Every book of the Bible has a message. It has a central thought. It has a theme. Now, if you read through this, these three chapters, to me, the overriding idea was to speak sound doctrine. Over and over, Paul admonishes uh, Titus for him to speak t sound doctrine for him to teach sound doctrine 
and to pass it on to these people. So to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's, you know, there's a picture of what the at-a-glance chart looks like on the screen. And so I filled in at the top the theme of this book is Speak Sound Doctrine. And you can even um, increase that Speak Sound Doctrine and go Do Good Deeds. And we're going to look at that word deeds in a little bit and, and kind of take that apart. The author, we all know. Who was the author? Paul. Right. Now, there's some key words. And remember, Kay asked you to mark these key words. Why? Because it draws your attention as you are reading the scripture to the, the central idea of that scripture. Some of the key words just in this first chapter are doctrine, deeds, sound, teach. And one way down here that we'll get to later, God our Savior is repeated several times. That one we're going to talk about uh, in, in a <coughs> excuse me when we get to the third chapter. The purpose for this uh, for this letter being written, this actually sort of a book of instructions to Titus, was it was a it was an instruction booklet as he ministered on this island of Crete. Now these were idol worshippers. These were not believers entirely there were some believers obviously there were churches there uh so it, his his mission was to minister to these people as i said earlier uh historically this took place about 62 a.d uh on this island of crete and even within these the churches that are there there were ungodly leaders now, if you've ever been a part of a situation where a leader was ungodly, what does that do to a congregation? It destroys a congregation. It destroys a fellowship. It destroys God's message to that congregation. So Paul is leaving Titus there to correct this problem. Now, let's begin by looking at chapter 1. So keep your at-a-glance chart out, and let's begin by looking at chapter 1 um, of the... Found my notes. <laughs> right where I left them. I just, I just glanced, and I thought, there they are. <laughs> so in chapter 1, there's some themes here. Chapter 1 is a contrast of godly and ungodly leaders. A contrast of godly and ungodly leaders. He touches on both in chapter 1. So let's begin by looking at those first four verses. Uh, if you break this down into sections, it's a lot easier. Several of you said this was a hard lesson. This was, this was something that I struggled with. Well, let's break it down in small segments so that you're not struggling so much with it. We've established that Paul is the author. And, you know, like all of his writings, isn't it strange to us that the author of the letter is identified at the beginning? When do we identify the author of a letter? The end. You know, yours truly, prayerfully, sincerely or if you're writing it to someone special, love. You know, but Paul says, Paul, a bondservant, he, he identifies himself right at the beginning, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. Both of those are key words, truth and godliness. Now, godliness is not, blame, is not sinless any more than blameless is sinless. But godliness is assuming or uh, uh, showing the character of God. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, we can rest on that promise. This is, uh, here we're seeing uh, not only the contrast of the godly and ungodly, but we see greetings from Paul in those first four verses. Greetings. He's greeting the people. At the proper time, this manifested in his word, in the proclamation with which 
I was entrusted. Paul says, this is personal to me. I've had a personal contact with God, and he has entrusted me with this message to you, Titus. Well, we could substitute any one of our names. Look at that. You know, I could very easily read that to say, which Paul has, in, which Paul has proclaimed and has been entrusted to send to Marianne. You've got to make it personal because that's what this letter is. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace um, from the God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. When you look at that word grace, remember that's um, us getting what we don't deserve. I, I don't deserve what, what God gives me. I don't deserve eternal life. I don't deserve uh, forgiveness of my sins. I've done nothing to earn that. That's God's grace, but it's also his mercy. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. I deserve death. I don't deserve the good things. So in God's grace and his mercy, I receive his blessings. So those first four verses, Paul starts, right? And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this with the overview because we're going to go back. Trust me, we're going to go back and look at every bit of this, but in an overview, we need to cover it so at least you know what's going on. So those first four verses center mostly on the greetings to Titus, who is Paul's true child. Then look at verses 5 through 9. He says, in this, you're going to see the, uh, the character traits that he points out of the overseer or of the godly overseer. For this reason, here's why, he says, I left you in, uh, on this island in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city I directed you. He says, I have a plan for you, and God showed me this plan, and you must follow it. This is what God wants you to do. You need to appoint uh, elders in every city. Now, these churches had not been in existence long enough at this time for the elders to have been placed or overseers to be in place. So Titus is left with this job. Look at what he says then. He says, and here's what these people should look like. Now, again, we are not going to get hung up in this right now. This is, we're going to come back to it, I promise you. If any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, mainly what he is, the overriding thought here is a man of good standing, a family man who governs his family well, who is faithful, who is not, uh, we get a little bit later when he's called factious, uh, an, an ungodly a man who is uh, a troublemaker, but uh, what he's looking for are peacemakers, wise men, men who are willing to listen to the voice of God. And we're going to get into the rest of it later, so bear with us. Um, the overseer must be above reproach. He, his character must be without question. You know, you're... Your reputation is what other people think of you. You have a good reputation. You know, they think you're a nice person. They think you're generous. They think you're loving. But your character is what you really are. Your reputation is what other people think you are. Your character is what you truly are. And if your character comes in question, if you do not have a good a good character will show as a good reputation. And if you don't have that, then what uh, Paul is saying here is those are not the kind of people we want. You need to be above reproach. There does not need to be a question about who you are and, and where you stand. You must be faithful. Not self-willed, not quick-tempered, Obviously, none of these people had red hair. <laughs> Just saying, none of these were red-headed people. Um, it, it, hold your temper. 
be sure that you're not uh, at, chomping at the bit to, to be able to um, always have your way. Not addicted to wine. Not pugnacious. Now that simply means not violent. Not, not pugnacious, not violent. Not fun, fond of sordid gain. That's greed. That's very simply greed. Have you ever known someone that was really greedy? You know, I just got to have... <laughs> this is a, a very um, small illustration. We had two sisters at our church in, in Tennessee. And um, if we had a covered dish, as soon as that last person got through the line, they were up there with takeout containers and they had their food for the rest of the week you know and I, I would look at them and the several of us would punch one another and say they're at it again you know uh, and nobody no one begrudged them their food it was just funny because to me that's greedy it's like uh, you're fr and and it wasn't a question of money with them they had plenty but uh, greed it comes in all kinds of form and Paul is saying these are not people that need to be in charge. These are not people that need to be an overseer. These are part of the people that need to be uh, replaced. They need to be hospitable. To whom? To strangers, for instance. They need to think about the people that, that their paths are going to cross. Think about those. Loving what is good and sensible then he says, just. Now, if you're just, you're, you're going to be obeying the law, right? Let, let me challenge you that when you do these, particularly the New Testament, when you're doing some of these epistles that Paul has written and you come across these words, um, you can actually do it on your phone. There is a, an app, a Blue Letter Bible, and uh, you can look up these words because so, so many times what we see as our definition of the word is not the transliteration from the Greek. So what Paul is saying here is these should be law-abiding people. These should be people that, uh, that um, respect the law. They should be devout. That means they're willing to obey. And they should have self-control. They should not be... They should not have a short fuse. They should have themselves under control, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teacher, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound got, uh, doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Exhort simply means that you urge. It's a powerful urging. Refute means that you... Uh, correct you correct uh, what is wrong so uh, that's what he's talking about he said now here's in verse 10 let's look at it for just a second in verse 10 he says there are many rebellious men empty talkers and deceivers especially those of the circumcision well who do you think he's talking about there the Jews the people who should be above reproach those of the circumcision those who are probably in the churches some of them and he's saying you know it sometimes it surprises us do we have troublemakers in our churches today sure we do sure we do because we're human and we have people from all walks and we have people with all different personalities and he says they should not be rebellious or empty minded they shouldn't be empty talkers well now what is an empty talker you're going to see it again in verse in chapter two what's an empty talker it's a gossip it's a gossip now we tend to think about people being empty talkers as or gossips as being women don't we well he's talking about church overseer which was a man so he's saying you know the men are guilty too and this is what I want you to correct. So as we go along, that's, that's, what we, that's what we see. 
They must be silenced because they are upsetting the whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. In other words, they are, uh, there are families that are suffering. There are families that are suffering. These are the, uh, in um, verses 10 through 16, we see the character traits of an ungodly leader. Verses 10 through 16 show us what an ungodly leader looks like. One of, the, of themselves, one of their own, he's saying, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Well, that's the, uh, you know, someone that was from Crete actually made that statement. Uh, they did not have a good reputation. They were not a, 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 a spiritual people. He said, this testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them. Now, if you reprove someone, you scold them. So Paul is telling Titus, you're going to have to straighten these people out. I don't envy Titus this at all. How would you like to walk into this? How would you like to, uh, you know, thank you, God, you did not, uh, you did not uh, task me with this to do. So, yeah, um, I, 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 don't, I, don't need to, I don't need to worry about that. Uh, I, he didn't give me that job. I'm not here to correct you. Um, so that they may be sound or whole. That's what this word sound means. Here's the Greek word for it. And don't ask me to, to pronounce any of these Greek words. Uh, I took two years of Latin. And I can tell you I can't translate anything. Uh, the, only, the only thing that it ever uh, helped me with was that medical terms so often are reflective of the Latin derivative, and it helped me to spell those. That's the, only pro uh, that's the only thing I profited. But sound, this word that is uh, translated here from the Greek means whole, whole doctrine, whole, sound, um, what is right, um, healthy, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. These Jewish myths that he's talking about were legends or extra to the law. You remember how many laws there were, how many thou shalt nots that were added? We didn't need but ten. We didn't need but ten commandments. But the Jewish faith, um, they had a thou shalt not for everything. The one that I always thought was the most amusing was that they could not rock on... Um, the Sabbath, because that stirred up dust, and that could be considered plowing, and that was work. And I'm thought, I'm thinking, I don't rock that strong, you know, <laughs> uh, not enough to, not enough to stir up that much dirt. They need to be pure. All things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. That word defiled means contaminated contaminated, ruined. Their, their theology was ruined. Their, um, their uh, witness in the community was defiled. They, had, they were following a contaminated doctrine. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled, everything about them. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. Deeds. It's this word over here, I can pronounce that one, ergon, which means your work, your acts, or your deeds. That's the Greek uh, terminology that was used. It says they, they say they know God, but they don't, by their actions, they don't show it. What would we call that? Hypocrisy. And you remember, you remember how... In theater at that time, they had a mask, a happy face so that it looked like their character was happy. Or they had a sad face or an angry face that showed what their character portrayed otherwise. Well, that's what these people were. They were wearing masks, not physically, but they, they pretended to be one thing, but they were something else. If you're going to talk the talk, make sure you walk the walk. Make sure that you're 
that what you do lines up with what you are talking about. Jesus, Jesus cleared all that up for us in the Sermon on the Mount in the seventh chapter of Matthew. I want to read that to you, beginning in the six, 16th verse. But you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. You don't have to be standing in judgment of people. It's only picking fruit. My uncle sh used to tell all of us as we were growing up, I'm not judging, I'm just picking fruit. By your fruits, people know you. The way you act, are you generous? Are you kind? Are you loving? Are you, are you forgiving? That's your character coming out. And that's the way people will know you, is by the things you do. Instead of, oh no, we're, we, you know, they, they don't fit in, we don't want them. We don't want them. We had a, a, an incident at our former church one Sunday morning. A woman and some children came in, very, very, very poorly dressed. And um, they stayed through the entire service. As, they, as the service was over, I passed them. They were down front talking to the, to the preacher. I passed them, and I have to tell you, the odor from those people was so bad that it literally took my breath away. But they had come looking for clothes and food. And when the preacher turned around to me and said, Marion, will you take these people downstairs? I thought, oh, my goodness, God. I felt kind of like, uh, like Beth Moore combing that man's hair, brushing that man's hair in, in the uh, airport. And I thought, why me? Why me? Why do you want me to do it? There are other people over here that could. But I took them. I took them, and when they got ready to leave, they hugged me. And I have to tell you, that was one of the sweetest hugs I've ever had. Did it smell bad? Oh, yes, it did. But, you know, I didn't notice it by the, time they, by the time they hugged me. I didn't notice the odor then. So Jesus says, you know, the way you do this, your life is your, is your greatest testimony. And Paul is telling Titus here, these are the kind of people that we want as overseers. This is what God has entrusted to me to give to you. So as we move into chapter 2, there's a, there's a theme for chapter 2 as well. Now to me, the theme was simply, if you look, if you look down in the, um, in the text and we'll see it, is that God has brought salvation to everyone. If you look down into verse 11, Paul says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. So to me, that <coughs> excuse me, that was the overriding message of chapter two. But chapter two gets really specific, and we are going to look at this in detail as we go along. This is just, as I said, keep saying over and over, an overview. Verses one and two. Let's see what that says, so you can fill it in on your chart. As for you, Titus, now he makes it personal. He, it, it, he's still talking to Titus through this whole thing. This is what you need to do. He says, you speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. That is uh, doctrine that is healthy, doctrine that is whole, and it's up to you because it's from God and you are to pass it on. So verses 1 and 2 simply say, speak sound doctrine and immediately he says and in doing that here's what the older men are responsible for 
So verses 1 and 2 speak sound doctrine and the instructions for older men. Okay. You know, it, it does kind of bother me here. I have to tell you that he only dedicated one verse to men. And he dedicated three to women. <laughs> that kind of bothers me, I have to admit. Older men are to be temperate. Now, this is something they are to do continually. It's not just on Sunday. It's not just put on your Sunday face to, to go out. You're to be temperate, dignified, sensible. Hmm, that, now, there's wh what, what does that mean, to be sensible? Well, it means to be sound in faith. It means to love. And it means to persevere. That means staying the course. You older men are supposed to keep doing these things. And you're supposed to do them as an example to the younger men. That's what, that's what, uh, that's what your job is. Then he says verses 3 through 5 are instructions to the older women. Well, that takes in every, one, every woman in here because we don't have any super young women in here. All of us are old enough to be an example. Older women are likewise. Now, that means just like the men, you're to exhibit all of those things that the, that the men exhibit. You're to be reverent in your behavior not malicious gossips. Now, you know, it, it, he's already been talking about these empty talkers, these idle talkers, and now he gets right down to the core of it, and he says, gossip is malicious. What does gossip, uh, what is, is there any good outcome to gossip? No, there's nothing good about it, and yet um, do all of us participate in it? Men and women, yeah, we do. You know, what was that line from um, Steel Magnolias? If you, if you don't have anything good to say about someone, come sit by me. You know, come, come sit over here and tell me so, I can, so I'll be able to know it too. Um, we all, at, at one time or the other, do participate in gossip. Not enslaved to too much wine. In other words, you need to be in control forever. You don't need to have things that are not supposed to get out of your control. What happens when a person has too much alcoholic beverage? They, yeah, they don't even know what they're doing uh, the majority of the time. Uh, they are out of control if, if they have too much to drink. And he says that, no, you, you're not supposed to do that. And then... Here he gets really personal. You need to be teaching what is good so that you may encourage the young women. It's our job as older women to be an example to the younger women. It's our job to teach them what to do. And it says very specifically to love their husbands and to love their children. Now, God never called a woman to be a doormat. He did tell us that we were to be in subjection to our husband. That doesn't mean the husband is a tyrant. That doesn't mean that he has a club over you. But he is, he is supposed to be the head of the home. He is supposed to be the head of the home. And I don't think there's a woman in here who does not. If, if so, please don't tell me that it's you because it'll, it, it'll hurt my feelings. Uh, <laughs> there's not a woman in here, I don't think, who does not like to be in control of her home. It, please don't tell me if you don't because then I'm going to feel worse. We want to be in control, and God is saying, in loving your husband, you allow your husband to be in control. And you love your children. And that doesn't mean just, oh, I'm going to wrap my arms around you and I'm going to tell you I love you. Uh, some of you were in here this morning as I was finishing a conversation with my daughter-in-law. I learned a long time ago 
as all of you know, my, my mother died when I was very young, and I missed a lot of that. And so I never close a conversation with either of our boys, our daughter-in-law, or any of our grandchildren without those three little words. I love you. I love you. And what I mean by that is you are important to me. You are, a, you have my heart. Um, I, I, you know, it, it, there's that bond. And so you love your children. You, you teach these younger women not just so much the lip service, but how, when you love them, also when you love them, you discipline them. You teach them how to raise children. It's a big, it, it's a big responsibility. But God said, this is what... This is what you are supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be sensible. You're supposed to be pure. That means you're set apart. You're supposed to be pure and honest in your thinking. Workers at home. I, I, you know, he could have left that out. <laughs> because I, uh, truly a woman's work is, is never completed, is it? One of the things my daughter-in-law was telling me this morning was, she, w she had a doctor's appointment, and she's very health conscious. And so at 6.30, she was up going to the gym like she is every morning, which I think is insane. But <laughs> anyway, she does that. Um, and she said, well, I had to get up extra early because they were coming. The, ha the women that cleaned my house were coming today, and I had to wash all the dishes that Doug left last night. And I'm thinking... <laughs> Well, why didn't you make Doug wash the dishes? You know, he if he dirtied them up. So a woman's work truly is not complete. We get up, we work long hours. Go back and read in Proverbs, a virtuous woman. A, woman's, a woman has more to do. And he says, you teach those young women to be workers at home, to take care of their home, to value their home, to cherish that home. That's what their job is to be kind, being subject to their own husbands. Yeah, that he is the head of the house so that the word of God will not be dishonored. What do you mean by that? Well, he's, he's already told us that uh, we're to be in subjection to our husbands, and if we aren't, then we are dishonoring his word. We don't want to do that. Then in verses 6 through 8, he talks to another group. He makes this very personal and Paul covers every group that, that is in this, in, in, on the island. Like, likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. Now, what he's saying here is, uh, Titus, you need to be an example. You are a young man, but you have the maturity of an older man. So you need to be teaching, by example, these younger men to be sensible. Show yourself as an example of good deeds, things that you do. We're not saved by our deeds. We're saved to do the deeds. We're not saved by them. You can't teach enough Sunday school lessons. You can't sing enough specials. You can't organize enough groups. You can't take food to enough people to earn your salvation. But what that is, is an outgrowth of your salvation. You do it because you were saved, because God ministered to you, you pass it on. And he says, you, by your example, you show this to the, to the young men to be pure in their doctrine, healthy, whole, to be dignified, sound in their speech, which again, he says, is above or beyond reproach. And then in verses 9 and 10, he says, Now, there's another group of you, these bond servants. These are slaves. These are people that are owned by other people. And those weren't healthy relationships. Those weren't healthy uh, situations in most cases. Urge the bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, uh, You know, that, that person that you work for, his name's on the door. He signs the check. If you weren't satisfied with it, then you need to look for another job. We had young women who would come in 
in entry level positions um, and be on the the front desk which I always thought was the wrong place to put them but anyway we did and they had all kinds of things these aren't fair these doctors aren't nice to me they don't you know and I was so tempted to say many times his name's on the door he's in charge if you don't like it then you go find one that you do like but he's in charge it, you're not I remember one year in particular a couple of them wrote oh flaming emails because they did not get as much in their Christmas bonus and I did find my voice that day and I said you know he didn't promise you a Christmas bonus that's an extra perk so you either take it and uh, and enjoy it or maybe this was not the job for you don't be argumentative there are people other people in control in in our case government you know we have to be subject to the laws of the land he says they should not be pilfering now what does that mean pilfering it means stealing usually small amounts because they were bond servants but it means stealing my mother used to say quit pilfering through that well I wasn't stealing and I wasn't old enough to know what that meant and I really don't think she meant that I was stealing but I was bothering something that wasn't mine and that's what he that's what Paul is saying here showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior this is a reference God our Savior to Jesus the second part of the Godhead to God our Savior then in verses 11 through 14 we see um, the grace of God bringing salvation and this uh, this is what we just read for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men the grace now that's that Greek word is C H A R I E and it means good freely bestowed on us what we didn't earn instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly righteously and godly in the present age because God brought salvation to us because he has saved us he has equipped us to live in this world and he continues to do it he does it's uh, it's an ongoing process he continues to equip us to live in the world that we are in in the present age it says looking for the blessed hope now that blessed hope is strictly the promise God's promises to us the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ we're back to this God our Savior Jesus is described by Paul as being our Savior and uh, he uses the second half of the Godhead and then he identifies how he did that he gave himself for us to redeem that word redeem simply means to purchase or to gain possession of he redeemed me I belong to him think about that ledger page think about that bookkeepers any bookkeepers former bookkeepers in here okay you got a ledger page right and you've got a a column of debits right and you got a column of credits right I mean that's simple that is as simple as bookkeeping gets and I know that's not you know that doesn't even scratch the surface but on my ledger page are all of these debits over here all of the ugly things I've ever said thought been a part of all the times I missed doing what God told me to do sins of omission oh my goodness our column of omitted sins the things we didn't do that we should have done sometimes far outweighs the commission the things we did and by rights that should have condemned me but what happened at Calvary was that God took that all of those bad debits over here the things that are against me 
and covered them with the blood of Jesus and moved them over to the credit page, the credit column. They're no longer, uh, he's wiped them out for me. I'm no longer accountable for those. Jesus answered that accountability at Calvary. So I have been purchased with his blood. Not mine, but with the blood of Jesus, I have been purchased. I belong to him. He redeems us from every lawless deed, everything I've ever done or ever will do. He doesn't have to do it again. You know, how can how do you how do how do we refuse to live according to what God says here when we don't have it, Jesus isn't going back to Calvary. He doesn't have to pay that price again. I don't have to be responsible for it. He wiped out everything I ever have done and everything I ever will do, and not just for me, but for every single solitary person who has ever breathed in the world from creation on. So he's, he, and he equips us to live according to that type. Of, I belong to him. If I'm a child of the king, I need to act like it. I need to act like I'm a child of the king. I don't need to act like that I haven't been purchased. And to purify for himself a people of his own possession, zealous for good deeds. He took that ugly heart of mine and made it pure, made it whole, made it wholesome, made it his, and made me his. I belong to him. And so he says to Titus, this is a direct quote to Titus. You're to do these things. You're to speak sound doctrine. You are to exhort or urge. And then you are to reprove or correct with all authority. And don't let anyone disregard you. Don't let anyone, because you are too young, don't let that stand in your way. Don't let them disrespect you for that reason. As we move on to chapter 3, uh, and we look at a theme for that chapter, to me it simply says, God saved us, not on, my, uh, not on our acts, but his mercy. And he continues this thought to, t to Titus as he comes from, verse, uh, from chapter 2 into chapter 2. He says, not only are you to speak, exhort, and reprove, but you remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good uh, deed. Our Christian lifestyle demands that we give proper respect to those who are over us. Verses 1 through 11 talk about that. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 are God's instructions based on his grace. It's God's instructions to us. He says you're to malign no one. You're to be peaceful and gentle. In other words, we're supposed to be model citizens. We're not supposed to be rabble-rousers. We're not supposed to... Uh, all of you remember uh, when the riots were going on in downtown Atlanta, what, four years ago? That's not something that a Christian should be part of. We watched those very fearful that our grandson would not be able to get home. Uh, he was at that time, um, because his, his dad is the senior VP for last parking, when those boys were in college, uh, he put them in parking garages and said, here you go, boys. You be nice to people, they'll tip you. You're not nice to them, you get this pitiful little pay, but you're going to do it. And one of our grandsons was working in one of the places in Buckhead. And as we watched that and agonized over whether he would get home safe or not, it was terrible. I mean, he called home and said to our daughter-in-law, this is scary. And she said, keep your windows rolled up. I'll get you out of there. I'll direct you home. 
and she did we're not supposed to be part of that kind of thing we watched uh we've watched other things on tv and we've seen how uh mob violence gets out of control we're not supposed christians are not supposed to to be a part of those kinds of things he says you're supposed to honor the authorities because we were once foolish ourselves. That, that's what our life was like before salvation. We had no understanding. We were disobedient. We were deceived. We were even enslaved to lust and pleasures, spending our life in hateful things, malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. And here's one of those holy buts. But... When the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, not because we'd done more than anybody else, not because we were better than anybody else, but by his mercy, that not giving us what we deserved. What I deserved was not what I had. He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope or the promise of eternal life. So you see both sides of the coin there, both the mercy, not getting what we deserved, and the grace, getting what we didn't deserve. You see both sides of what God did for us there in, in Paul's instructions. He says this is a trustworthy statement, and I want you to speak confidently to those who have believed that God will be careful to engage in and be careful to engage in good deeds. In other words, do the things that bring glory to God. Do what elevates God in the, in the eyes of the people. Do what God would do, not what foolish men are doing. Avoid foolish controversies and genealogies. He says these are just... You know, these controversies are ungodly traits, so avoid them. Reject a factious man. That's one who stirs up trouble. Be careful of them. And then he closes this by saying, I'm going to send my friends, some of my other friends, and I want you to greet them. I want you to greet them uh, and, te and treat them uh, with respect. So that says to us, as we greet one another, as more people come in, as our fellowship grows, we're to greet and welcome. That's what greet means, welcome. Welcome these people, no matter, no matter if they do smell really bad. Welcome them. Welcome them into it. All who are with me welcome you. Now you welcome those who love us in the faith grace be with you grace it's a state of, of sanctification and it's undeserved from god so why why did uh did uh paul write this letter to the uh to titus um he wrote it to encourage titus in the task before him it was an encouragement a, a road map to encourage titus in appointing elders and to, re and to correct those who were teaching unsound doctrine. Just as the island of Crete was a fallen society we and, and was engaged in unsound, un ungodly kind of doctrine, we need to recognize that in our own, in our own world and in these three short chapters, is there anything that Paul has left out to us? Not a thing. And as we take this apart in the coming weeks and we look at it in every, how it applies in everything that we do, the critical question here for us um, is simply, how can a godless society fail to be impacted when there's a vibrant, healthy church in its midst? How can Jefferson, Georgia, fail to be impacted when First Baptist Church of Jefferson adopts 
the godly character that Paul is talking about or any other church in our, in, in our, in, in our town. I just use this one because this is where most of us are. But how can, how can, we, how can our town help but be impacted if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing? Does anyone have anything? Next week we'll be in lesson two, and I have no, I have no doubt that we will not finish lesson two next week because it goes even deeper. Um, but that's okay. We are under no, we're under no obligation to finish it in a week's time. We will keep going until we are finished with it, and we actually will go back and pick up some from this week. Uh, anybody have anything they want to add? Did I completely muddy the water for you? So, as Paul says to Titus, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. That's to every one of us. Speak sound doctrine. What, what we need to be doing. Any questions? Don't know that I have all the answers, but if I don't know, I'll say I don't. There's lots of things I don't know. Now, I never told my children, you know, or my grandchildren. In fact, one of our granddaughters uh, said to her dad, well, Grandma knows everything.